Thanks, thanks for inviting me for, for this session. Uh, um, I guess first, first uh, shout out to uh, CMC. Uh, when we started Ranovis in 2012, uh, uh, we, we, we were looking to see uh, how, are the, um, how could we access uh, technology and other things very capital efficiently and also tap into the Canadian ecosystem. And CMC was, uh, um, I, I didn't know about the company. Um, I just come back to Canada after being 15 years away uh, from Canada, working in uh, Germany for seven years and England for, uh, I guess, five years and, you know, uh, four years in Latin America and uh, balance of it in the U.S. Uh, so I really didn't know what was going on in Canada after Nortel had uh, had uh, disintegrated. We'd lost a lot of capacity and capability in uh, in, in Canada to have um, our uh, universities uh, tap into uh, the uh, the fabrications, the foundries that Nortel had uh, financed and uh, put together with the Canadian government money. Uh, so when I when I first spoke to uh, CMC, I was really fascinated by the model that they come up with to help the ecosystem and. Uh, uh, it was a group of people who, uh, who thought, um, uh, you know, Canada needs to have access to these advanced uh, foundries uh, and uh, they put something together which looks fantastic, you know, and we've really benefited from the graduates from uh, CMC programs and other things inside Ranovis and I'm sure the ecosystem would benefit for it for many years to come. So, um, I guess uh, first thing uh, on, uh, um, well, I'm not the mountain of wisdom here, <laughs> in spite of everything you heard a few minutes ago about how to build companies and all that. I've, uh, I've uh, just to give you a short brief background on, my, on myself uh, in terms of how the journey, because the journey really sort of defines the, the person and the decisions they make. Uh, so I, I came to Canada in 1982 uh, uh, from Iran. And um, this was, I, I guess we left in 1981 through a, uh, through a story that would take much longer than an hour for me to to share with you, uh, and prior to coming to 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 Canada, I, I lived in Spain for a year, uh, and uh, I came to Canada in '82. Um, and um, yeah, as 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 you mentioned, I did my education here uh, two years in Quebec uh, in the uh, college CJP, uh, and then uh, at Waterloo, and then I came back to uh, Montreal to start a company uh, there, Unicad Information Systems, in 1980. Eight, I would say. So it's a long, long time ago. And a few years after that, in parallel, as I had my company, I, um, um, I, I, I did my MBA at McGill, uh, for, which took me five years. Uh, <laughs> when you do things part-time as you have a company, it's, uh, it takes a lot longer. Uh, so a lot of, lot of good learnings there. But as I was trying to scale our CAD CAM, it was a CAD CAM software development for uh, simulations of radio and other types of um, transmission. Um, and Nortel was one of our big customers, and um, and uh, then uh, I, 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 you know, they, they bought part of my company, and I joined uh, Nortel uh, in the system engineering group in optical communication in '95, I would say, yeah. And then the journey started to go around the world. Since I spoke Spanish, and uh, they sent me to Mexico for two years, and uh, I was uh, working on the system engineering, network engineering, and. Uh, I'm working with Telmex, Telstra, and a couple of other, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, Telmex and uh, Avontel and a few other uh, uh, big networks that Nortel was bidding to win in, uh, in there. And uh, then I went to Brazil for two years, um, uh, working with Telesp, uh, Telefono Sao Paulo, uh, in the uh, network engineering, system engineering for Nortel, and uh, Embrotel, which was the group, big, big, uh, a big group there. Uh, uh, then after that, I went to London to run their um, Metro Optical Business uh, Unit uh, from there uh, uh, for for several years, and um, and then I was recruited into a startup in uh, Germany um, uh, called Core Optics, um, which was doing um, signal processing chips for uh, high speed communication as a CEO. So I joined them in two thousand and three. Um, I left Nortel. And I joined them in two thousand and three, and. Uh, uh, I ran that company for seven and a half years. We uh, develop uh, signal processing chips to uh, remove the optical components in the network, uh, high-speed uh, um, modules. Uh, and um, yeah, and then uh, Cisco made an offer to buy the company in 2010. Uh, this was after Sienna bought Nortel's optical division. Uh, just about a few months later, uh, uh, they called me up and they said, would you be interested in uh, in the transaction? And, um, and we, we went for that transaction. And then I came back to Canada in um, in 2010 so uh, uh, that journey of coming back here and uh, looking at the ecosystem um, you know I I started a fund uh, spoke technologies to co-found and co-fund companies not to provide financing for 
companies off the street, uh, but just uh, looking to start companies uh, and basically be the owner of them as we go forward. You saw some of the names there in identity management, uh, security, encryption, and uh, I came across this technology uh, in, um, um, in, in Ottawa uh, with one of my other colleagues who is a co-founder uh, for Ranovis, which is a quantum dot uh, laser technology. It's a, a technology to build lasers, which will create multi-wavelength multi uh, sources. And uh, we quickly, within, within about, uh, um, I would say, probably within about um, eight months after we started, uh, there was a session actually set up by CMC, which we ran into one of the professors of um, um, physics and engineering uh, um, from McMaster, uh, to, who was talking about um, silicon photonics and uh, how this is, uh, they, were, they were doing the work in that area. So in 2012, we started in silicon photonics and uh, doing all sorts of um, uh, tape outs with boutique foundries at that time. And, um, and there are still, those foundries are still around. Um, but now what has happened in this domain is a lot of things have moved into tier one foundries uh, like TSMC, Global Foundry, Tower Jazz and others. And the boutique ones are still operating, but uh, they haven't been able to scale. Uh, and silicon photonics is becoming a major topic. Uh, we develop uh, also our drivers and TIAs, all the analog high speed uh, signals. Um, so we opened a facility in Nuremberg, uh, where my previous company was, Core Optics, across the street from Cisco. And uh, the people who were not happy with uh, being in a bigger company and wanted to uh, uh, join us to uh, drive uh, the, uh, you know, the business in a new innovation area, uh, they just hopped over the street and uh, joined us. Um, and uh, there's a lot of journey and a lot of, lot of stories I can tell you <laughs> about how we got to where we are today. And uh, today we work on... Um, um, very, very compact, uh, high capacity IO. Um, um, we, um, we, our, our first platform that we launched, uh, um, Odin earlier this year is, is a platform that allows you to have uh, multi terabit, uh, connectivity for inside the data center for machine learning and AI, both for AI, ethernet applications, as well as machine learning and AI to be able to co-package these with uh, processors and FPGAs and ethernet switches and things of that nature. One of the things that I, for those of you who might've seen what we do, this is, uh, we, we did a little bit of a work on co-packaging uh, optical modules. These are the Ranovis pieces uh, with uh, switch, switch fabric so that this thing could support about 51.2 terabit uh, of connectivity uh, uh, versus today's technologies, which are at 12.8 terabit. So there's a lot of background there, but, uh, um, we'd be happy to talk about all that journey of how we raised money and uh, what, what uh, you know, how we worked on non-dilutive funding and all the other aspects of it. But uh, what I and please feel free to raise your hand and um, and ask questions as we go along. This is more of a fireside uh, chat, and as I go through the presentation, more than happy to divert uh, and go to a different direction uh, uh, based on the questions. Um, so if I look through, um, um, let's see if I can go to the next chart first. Yeah, so from a, so the brief that CMC had given me for this talk was really to talk through, um, uh, through, through, for, for, with a group of people who are interested in starting their own companies or <clears throat> they have ambitions to do other things. And uh, I was trying to uh, rewind and try to see from a highest level um, how the thought process from a simple mind of myself uh, would go through and, uh, um, I think the, 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 the primary thing I would always ask, um, you know, anybody who wants to join us or anybody who wants to uh, uh, start a company who comes uh, to me for financing or for advice and all that is, is the first question is, uh, you know, what are your objectives? Because that's, that's pretty much would be the, and it's very hard. Sometimes people look at you and say, what do you mean? I mean, they, and they start thinking about what is, the, what are their objectives really? <laughs> and some of them might be financial. Some of them might be doing something extraordinary, uh, and that would have an impact on environment, some social aspects. Some of them have triple bottom line type of approach. Uh, uh, some of you might be aware, you know, aware of these type of things that you can also, um, you can do something good for society as well as environment whilst making money. I mean, that would be a, that would be a uh, tool de chapeau, you know, for that. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's very, very important to, um, to, to look inside and see what, uh, what is it that you wanna do. And once you've locked into that, um, look and see what are the, um, 
at least what I've seen in terms of the um, the factors that can make you successful in achieving your objectives. Uh, there are many, there are many, many multitudes of them. Some of them are under your control and some of them are not under your control. So none of us could have uh, forecasted COVID. Um, none of us could have uh, forecasted the uh, uh, September 11. You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, um, with certainty, I mean, of course, everybody can forecast things, but, uh, you know, uh, certainty is another element. Uh, um, so the things that you have outside your control, well, let put them aside. And uh, uh, the things you have control over, Main, that, that can give you a higher chance of success um, is really the quality of the decisions you make. And this could be for your personal life or for your professional life. This is not, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm old, old enough right now that I can be a little bit reflective on, uh, on these type of things. Uh, and I've seen time and time again that the quality of the decisions you make, uh, how they could put you on the right track, on a wrong track. And at every junction, you come at a crossroad in a river going left or right, or maybe there's four or five uh, options. How do, you, how do you make a decision? And, um, and th that becomes central to, um, and people who judge you, who wanna give you money, they look at how you make decisions. They look at how you talk. They look at how you, what have you done in the past? What judgments have you made and things of that nature? So I think this is a foundational thing you wanna have, at least from my perspective in your, in your toolkit. And there's many, many ways, uh, decision frameworks that are out there. Uh, and as engineers or physicists and uh, academics, um, we're, we're very aware of those things, I mean, which, which is great. So you have a leg up on everybody, every other entrepreneur <laughs> out there from training perspective. And um, one thing which is very important in this is the decision-making context. Like what sort of uh, constraints do you have? Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next chart and you can do some reading on it if you, if you like and see uh, if that applies to you. And, uh, um, and um, more importantly, um, are the people making the decisions? And I think if I were to summarize as uh, one topic for one item for you to take away, it's really the people. And everybody talks about that. It's become a cliche, but uh, um, your, your key success for making the right decision is really the people that you have, that you consult with, or they're running the thing, the show beside you, and um, how their decision making in the past, and their insights they have, the, the way they go about it, how they have, how, how it has led them to failures. And the ones who've had a lot of failures uh, usually are, are great ones to have on your side, because they've tried many, many things. Uh, it was funny, I had a chat with one of the, uh, one of the largest hyperscale data center players, uh, um, and they were asking me, they said, well, I mean, we were interested in knowing about the problems that you have that you are not able to find a solution for. And I reflected for a few seconds and I said, well, I'm not sure if I want to share those with you. And he said, well, why is that? I said, well, we've spent tens of millions of dollars to discover these problems. So by sharing it with you, uh, we're just giving it, those problems are our IP. Now our solutions to those problems are going to be are going to create more IP. So why would we share with you the problems we have? And, and they were laughing on the other side. I said, well, this is the first time we heard from anyone not wanting to share their problems with us because we have this much resources, we can apply to it and all that. But of course, the conditions on that are, are quite different. So looking at uh, just quickly going through uh, these the decision um, um, making contexts, uh, context, uh, there are four, these are, this is just one framework. You can look at other ones and it has four areas, chaotic context, uh, complex context, complicated and simple. And if I look at, uh, and you have these charts so you can have a look through, I'm not gonna go through all of, uh, all of the details of it, but uh, a chaotic context uh, of decision-making would be um, something unfortunate or fortunate. Uh, uh, in this case, I've put an example of September 11th, which was a very unfortunate situation. And in that context, how do you make a decision? And um, it, it's, um, it's, you don't have time for too much analysis. You know, what, what it says here, for example, is uh, you're, you're looking at uh, stopping the bleeding and restoring order first. So you need a certain level of uh, people that can do those type of things, that they don't, uh, they don't just get shocked and just turn themselves off in your business and say, oh my God, we don't know what to do now. Let's say there's a, a battle between China and the United States over a trade war, which Ranovis has gone through, and it impacted us severely because one of our customers was Chinese. And um, so we could have just sat back and start you know, raising our hands and say, oh, you know, we can't do anything anymore. What is this and all that? But 
really you have to really regroup and say, okay, what do we do to to fix this thing? And that's that's one one context in terms of your decision making. The other context, which is quite uh, it's a little bit uh, let's say easier, is uh, is a complex context. It's, it's complex still, but uh, this would be like a the case where. Uh, um, you know, you hear on the uh, on the microphone that uh, Houston, we have a problem, right? There's a uh, this part of it. You uh, you're looking at unknown unknowns. You know, things that you didn't know uh, that um, that that was going to go wrong. And uh, now, what are you going to do about it? Uh, so that's a very very complex situation, and you need to have a certain level of uh, from your decision making. You have to try try and it's a sort of a trial and error. You try something, see if it works, then you. Uh, then you go back and um, measure it, and then you you do another try. And this is people who will be in this type of phase, uh, the leaders that will be in those areas, or your people that in your company, they really have to have that mindset that we're not here to solve the entire problem in one chunk because we, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, this is one other context that you have to be very aware of. And uh, this the third one is, um, is a little bit less um, uh, critical, a like complicated context. This is examples of uh, new things you want to develop. Um, so you you know what you don't know. You know, for example, the uh, the power consumption of it has to be less. Um, the antenna has to have this reach. You know, these type of things. You have those things. So you it's um, it's a little bit simpler. Um, and the decision making in that phase relies more on expertise of people. Uh, so as you can see, the degree of this thing is getting a little bit simpler, simpler until it gets to the simple context, where uh, it's it's domain of best practice. This is um, simple things. You know, like example is a loan payment process um you know it's known knowns there's really systematically and as you go through the journey of the company you might start with the complex context and try to do your tests and trials like cmc was saying like you know the, the, the presentation earlier you may do some prototypes of different things and then try to find out which way you should point your uh, put your um, uh, point your research uh, investment in then try to move it to the complicated context. So make it a little bit simpler so you can create a program around it that is more deterministic. So you can be in a complex context, you may be in the physics domain uh, where you are in photonics, for example, is analog physics. Uh, uh, there's a lot of phenomena we don't know about. Uh, one of my, one of our co-founders actually told me once when we were working on the quantum dot laser, he said, Hamid, uh, um, I said, well, why is, why is this effect uh, demonstrating itself in our uh, bit error rate and our relative intensity noise. And he looked at me, he said, for this, um, we have to call the priest. You know, <laughs> what he meant was like, it's really in quantum physics that we don't really know what is, there's a lot of things that are unknown. And um, and that's really the unknown unknown. So we, we have to then uh, trial and error until we find out what the right recipe is. And you try to move yourself into complicated context. And then once you have narrowed things down and now you have a roadmap where execution is important, then you you turn those complex issues into simple context where you have to you have to allocate engineering resources you have to do these things so within a company um, you have to have people that are able to take through the journey through these different contexts because you will be exposed in the middle of them <clears throat> as you're trying to go happily from a complex context to a simple context you may be faced with a chaotic situation like COVID as it is today and then figure out how to how to react to that. Um, and I just wanted to share with you how our management team looks like in Ranovis so that you can see uh, how, how we, you know, what sort of bench uh, typical companies have to have to be able to lift uh, weights uh, that are well beyond their size. We're, we're 60 people company. Uh, so uh, you can see in, in this chart, I, I, you know, we have, uh, one, two, three. well, I have four ex-CEOs on this chart, uh, well, including myself. So maybe three other ex-CEOs in this chart who've uh, built companies and sold them north of you know, $250 million uh, to, the mar to, to buyers of different technologies. I have three C CTOs, ex-CTOs, and um, you know, I, can, I can go down the list in terms of R&D people and all that. We have like, I guess, uh, five R&D, head of R&Ds, um, and they're all playing different roles, right? So you have you have this this uh, fortunate situation that you your network from a, from the works you've done in the past creates a wider network that has a wider network and then all of a sudden you see that you have a very good coverage of the industry so just to quickly go through that george roll who's our cto he's based in nuremberg ex uh, uh, philips communication pki uh, they sold uh, uh, pki to lucent 
and they created the head of uh, high-speed uh, IC development in Lucent, uh, uh, which was a big competitor of Nortel. And we used to actually OEM their products from Nortel. And um, then he founded Core Optics. And then uh, when we sold Core Optics, um, he went and joined Cisco and he was a distinguished engineer there. At Lucent, he was a Bell Lab fellow. And he, uh, so he's a, he has a pedigree of many, many different generations of first uh, uh, first of the kind that he's brought into the market, along with Christoph, who's the head of our systems group. He's based in Nuremberg. And uh, also he runs an R&D team in Nuremberg, similar um, profile, uh, you know, Bell Lab fellows and, and so forth. Uh, Hojat Salemi, who's uh, our head of business development IC partnership, uh, he was ex-Nortel. He uh, spun off from Nortel to start uh, Skystone in Ottawa. And then he sold that to, um, to Cisco and uh, he built the IC team of Cisco in, in Ottawa. Then he left for Silicon Valley for 15 years uh, to start Cortina, uh, which was a high-speed um, FEC chip and multiple drivers, TIAs that they did. Then he sold that to Infi and um, to do their, and I don't know for some of you guys might know, Infi was just bought last week. Uh, at least the intention was uh, for $10 billion by Marvell. And he, he joined us uh, about three and a half years ago or so um, to run this, this space. Uh, uh, Shahar Mahavan, head of our program management, uh, journey through Lumentum, Newbridge, and, and to us, JDSU, and to us to uh, run the program. Alex Befar was a CEO of Binoptics, uh, uh, which was a laser company. He sold it to Maycom. He was there for several years. Uh, and then uh, his pedigree comes from IBM, and uh, he runs our laser development program. Um, then um, uh, Mike Sekirka, program management, uh, product management for us, uh, legacy from Nortel and Innovance and uh, and uh, Dragon Wave, and he ran a, a LiDAR company in Ottawa. He sold it a few months ago to a French company, and he joined us as a head of product management. Um, John Martino, head of our R&D uh, in Ottawa. He, his pedigree comes from JDSU and Lumentum building the uh, first generation and second generation of Rodems, uh, um, which were the best in class in the, in the world. Big, big delivery uh, engine. And uh, Christine, yeah, we've been, been very fortunate to have Christine on our, uh, on our roster. Uh, from a talent management perspective, and uh, uh, her background is from CBC. She had her own startup also, and he, she, she sold it before she was joined CBC. So we recruited her out of CBC in a very senior position to help us out with our team and the things we need to do. And Andre Lovassar, from a CF CFO perspective, he's taken companies public, Zarlinx, and you know, which was a spinoff from uh, Mitel and sold it to Cosemi. So, and he was a CFO of multiple startups. So when you look through this chart, what I want you to take out of this is really uh, um, for, for, for a company that is 60 people, having this level of seniority is, is pretty unique. And uh, these folks come together based on the relationships that have been built over many generations of things. And there's a network that is connecting them. So one thing, and I'll have some um, closing remarks in terms of what I would say um, would be my, my advice in terms of what, how, how, how to go and build teams of similar uh, capacities and capabilities. And um, you know, over the next decades or two or whatever your, your career is gonna take you, and how they, they would help you in different decisions you have to make. So just to give you an example, on the complex context, when we have a situation like this, and we've had multiple of them, by the way, um, we, uh, the four guys we go to, uh, to, to discuss things uh, are George, Christoph, Alex, and, and Hojat. And they, they'll, they'll go through the different discussions and all that. Of course, everybody in the um, staff is there and on, on our staff, but, um, we, we look at that side, that type of comments coming in from the experience they've had and what do we do now? You know, is, is there a new, new foundry we have to partner with? Let's say uh, our Odin platform is a monolithic um, um, chip. So it has driver TIA control chip as well as silicon photonics, uh, transmitter receiver, all of that uh, built in it. And when we made a decision to go that way in 2018, we had to look at the foundries and see who are the guys who can provide this technology and where, where have they gone and where do we have to take these foundries so that we can do something innovative. Now, those type of strategic discussions come through these type of dialogues. Uh, if, if the situation now has moved to a point where it's uh, complicated, which means that we still have a lot of uh, um, pieces to put together, um, most of the dialogue is between John, um, head of R&D, Christoph, head of R&D in Germany, Ojat, and Shahram, who's our program manager, with everybody else involved, of course. But they're the ones who are trying to narrow down and cut the branches of the tree. So we have a very well groom tree as it go, grows up, as opposed to be lopsided in one side of technology and not having the other side of it to, to try to balance it. 
Um, and, and then they, they work basically to try to converge everything in, a, in effect to a simple context uh, where we would have um, people could make their own decisions and execute. So people who've done circuit design, they know what they have to do. And most of the parameters have been worked out and they can go and execute on that. So, and, and then the rest of the team is involved in all of these from a business management perspective to make sure that what we're doing here, let's say if you choose a foundry, we have a strategic relationship with them. So they cannot step away from us because you know you can compare yourself to an ant and an elephant uh, uh, relationship. Uh, uh, how do you make the ant having the power over an elephant? Um, well, it's pretty difficult. It's very, very difficult, but uh, I, <laughs> I can share you one-on-one -on -one how we've done it uh, so that we can, we can be a major player in, uh, in multi-billion dollar companies roadmap uh, as a design house. And the capabilities we have from a systems perspective have put us in a pedestal where you can now influence the direction of a multi-billion dollar company. And they would listen to you guys. They listen to us and say, well, look, uh, um, what, what direction should we do to develop our process? In some cases, we have actually helped them develop their PDKs or other things of that nature. So it's um, this, this really um, uh, a way to map people to the de decision context, which I think is foundational so um, you, you cannot go into this thinking that uh, um, you will know everything about the market, you will know everything about the technology, you will know everything about everything. Uh, so the best is to have people around you that have done it before and have experience in these type of things that can help you out, be it as an advisor or be it as, a, as, as somebody who's, who is a co-founder or along the side with you. It's again, it's all about people. The rest of it, you know, you can have the most brilliant idea, and I'm sure everybody will tell you this, uh, um, but it's really all about people. So let's go into a little bit more, uh, um, you know, I have two more charts go and I'll, I'll just stop after that for questions. Um, um, so how do you get resources to achieve your objectives? And resources, as you know, are gonna be people, which we talked about extensively, and um, money is also important, you know. Uh, usually people are the ones who bring the money. Um, money comes to, those people, you know, because they have track record on things that they've done and they've returned money to investors, they've returned money to other, other shareholders uh, and uh, to the employees and so forth. So people will join those people and they also will provide funding just on the back of their name. This is really a critical thing. Now you could say, well, how could I, how could I do that if I've never done it before? Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that as well. You know, where, where would you start? You know, it's, um, um, yeah. And uh, so all of this, the people and the fund is really to buy you time to achieve your objectives. There's a time limit here too, <clears throat> because you may get enough funding to do the first pass of your product. And generally, if you're doing something differentiated, that falls short of the requirements of the market because somebody else would have done it if, they, if it was so easy for you to get to that state. So then you have to raise more money. And then what is your promise you make with the next batch of money that comes in and then how you deliver on those. So I would say one of the key factors I found is that the early stages of the company, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but at the earliest stages of the company, um, the founding team have to be able to cover multiple key dimensions of the company, uh, almost free of charge. So you have to have somebody who is uh, technically great, you know, in, in the field you're trying to do things. You have to have somebody who understands the market somebody who understands the business and finance side of it. So at least you have to have few elements that they can work for free and uh, for equity, basically. Or else you run out of money right away. Because if everybody wants to ask for their uh, true value in the market, uh, well, then they get no shares of the company. It becomes an employment agreement as opposed to a, a startup. So it's very, very important at that early stage. Um, and it could be just not the founding team. It could be advisors or other people you can't bring in. You say, okay, I'll give you this percentage of the company in terms of shares um, for you to help me out build this company or things of that nature. Um, when you get to seat financing, you, can, you have two structures you can look at. One is if you haven't achieved much with your company uh, and you expect within the next 12 months, you're going to achieve a next valuation for the company you can look for a convertible loan. Uh, and there are multiple companies out there that do this. And in, in, in um, Ontario, for example, IAF, uh, Investment Accelerator Fund at Mars, is a quite a good example of um, you know, doing convertibles. And there are other people that do this as well. 
and they have a time limit to it and say, well, in the next 12 months, this has to be turned into a financing and they, they give you, I don't know, 500K or a you know, million dollar, $2 million, whatever, if you add other people to it. And that's one option you have in terms of convertible, or if you have achieved things and you have purchase order from customers and you can articulate your value proposition, you can go for a price round uh, that has already a price tag of valuation on it, which really moves you more into series A. And in the series A, um, um, if you're looking at the type of things that uh, the people on this call, I would imagine on the hardware are looking at, uh, uh, be it physics, uh, chemistry, or um, engineering, or other types of things, <clears throat> you uh, and it's something disruptive. It would have some deep tech um, part to it. Uh, it won't be it won't be a typical software development where you could uh, um, the idea and then you have to create a market or other types of things you have to do. It's really more um, something that has a, let's say a 10, 15 year cycle. <laughs> if you're trying to really innovate, if you if you I mean. Innovation doesn't happen overnight. So um, if you have something that has 10, 15 years to, uh, to, to, to gestation period, then you need to choose the right VC uh, with you uh, at the early stages. Uh, somebody who understands that there's technical risk, somebody who's not scared of technical risk uh, and uh, would come along with you. It would come along with you and can then bring people for series B and series C to put on top and uh, based on their them being attached to the company. I think that's a really important element. Those deep tech uh, VCs, uh, are, we don't have that many of them in Canada. Actually, I don't think we have any. It might be one one started recently, but uh, um, you know, deep tech, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, like the, the folks who are in California or other places that we have a lot of access. Or you can bring people who are entrepreneurs who already are deep tech themselves. So they understand this game and how it's played and they don't get, um, you know, um, they don't they don't get discouraged by uh, by by failures because the failures to them is learning for you to take a next audacious goal you know to do the next thing and and that that growth is really what they're looking for uh, in terms of understanding series b um you know if you're successful you can do an insider round maybe bring one new investor from outside and once you get to series c uh it's time to bring strategics because that's really where you want the valuation of the company to be at the uh, high level and uh, the best way to have that, you cannot get that from VCs generally. Um, if you have a cash generating company, maybe you can get it from VCs. But in most cases, in deep tech, uh, you need a strategic to come in. And those strategics have double digit, triple digit, billion dollar market cap um, you know, in, in their public companies. And they understand the true intrinsic value of what you've done. And they want it for part of their portfolio. So they give you a higher valuation. And then they could buy the company as well. Later on, they probably negotiate on right of first refusal and all sorts of other things with you that you have to be careful about. But the company by that time has evolved to have the corporate governance for you to have added more people to, to yourself to be able to handle these if, if it is the first time for you. So don't get scared by what's happening later on. I mean, if you're doing the right thing and you get the traction, other people will start to get involved in helping you, helping you out. <laughs> and uh, and some of that, those helps are actually quite valid. I mean, the, my, when my first CEO job, uh, I went, I was a VP of uh, um, a business unit in Nortel. I had about a thousand people reporting to me in Ottawa and uh, in, um, in um, London, in England. Uh, and when I went to a CEO position, I... Um, I had already been a CEO of a smaller company before I joined Nortel, so I had some understanding of what was expected of me, but the investor management part of it was something that I wasn't used to. Um, but, um, you know, if you constantly focus on delivering value and look at the constituencies and see who wants what, then managing investors will become almost like a part of your job. Um, so, so you can go and grow your uh, um, you know, your, your capability or um, understand that, well, some things I'm just not, um, not good at and I need, I need help. Um, so um, the team at Core Optics, for, for example, at that time, the founders, uh, they were very good technically, but they, they, one of them was the CEO and then they changed another person to be the CEO inside the founder team. And then they realized after two years in that they, they needed a, somebody from outside to be the CEO. So then the board worked with them to do a recruitment and things of that nature. So the journey is uh, people will help you, uh, of course, along the way. Uh, and they have their own objectives, of course. Um, um, some of them, I mean, purely financial, or I'm not sure if they'll have environmental or social <laughs> objectives, but depends on the person, you, you can get different flavors. 
So that's uh, pretty much uh, what I had from, from that part. Um, There's some other imp more important items besides this funding that I talked about. I know everybody's interested in funding because you think, oh, if, I do, if you just give me the money, I know what to do with it. Don't worry about it, right? And, um, but uh, for people to give you money, they would want to have a very good understanding of you know, target market, lead customer, product definition, how do you take this to the market? Uh, and there's a lot of nuances in these things. Every single part of this is a discipline that, you know, somebody could be an expert in, you know, in sales and marketing and not be able to do things in product management, you know, so it's a, there's a lot of um, nuances there that you have to come by. Uh, from an early stage, when you start, the, probably the most important question I ask the folks at the early stage is what is your assessment of the technology readiness level of this technology? And I just put the, uh, some of you might be aware of this. It's uh, NASA. I think NASA came up with this thing uh, uh, and it has different levels. Uh, so TRL one would be uh, one and two would be uh, basic technology research is being done. You know, TRL three would be research to prove uh, feasibility. Then it goes all the way up to it's in operation and uh, the technology you get, it'll be in different places. So when we got the quantum dot laser, uh, the partnership we had, it was between TRL two and three. So once you know what TRL you are, you look at look up front and you say, oh my God, I need, I need to raise a lot of money for this. If you had something that you came out of university and you brewed it up to TRL five, then you have a different path, you know, in terms of investment. So this is very, very important. It determines the team you're going to be hiring, uh, the people you need, the time and the funding uh, that you require to bring this to market. Uh, strategic partners, very important. Um, you choose the wrong partner, you die with them. You know, it's a, it's, it's a person who's going to be in the boat with you uh, in the middle of the ocean. So uh, um, you, you have to really manage them like customers and they have to value you as opposed to, uh, you know, typically big companies use a big stick um, like Cisco and others. They have a big supply chain team and they do a lot of business with a foundry. So they can always bring that stick and say, well, we need you to work on our part. But when you're a small company, how do you influence these uh, foundries? It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. So you have to know those techniques of how to, how to do that. And there are many other items that I can think of that, um, you know, we, we only, uh, unfortunately we have only an hour on this one. But um, so uh, last chart, a um, few suggestions for the first time around uh, the block. Uh, if, you, if it's the first time you're trying to do a startup, uh, um, I think it's very important to know yourself. That's really, really important. And um, know what you're bringing to the table. And um, in that area, let's say it's technical, it's um, in design of high-speed um, analog circuits or whatever it is. You need to be at the leading edge of that area. Whatever you do, don't give that up. Don't get yourself into management and all these other things and things that other people could do, but really be true to that part at the beginning. And later on, you can do other things, but uh, uh, you need to make sure that that, di that differentiation that you bring to the table is best in class. So whatever you do there is a great investment. Uh, one other suggestion is, well, join a startup. You know, if you, uh, if you were, I guess there's a famous saying, if you want to own a restaurant, well, let's start by being a waiter, you know, on the, in the restaurant or a waitress uh, and uh, to just get to know what the heck is going on. So you're not, you know, you're, on, you're not, um, you're, you have to be aware of what are the things, dynamics that go through and all that. I found at Waterloo, I had a, a fortunate situation where I was in a co-op program and every, every quarter, every, um, every term that I used to go to a, uh, to a work term, I would, I would know who I don't want to be <laughs> and which jobs I don't want to have because I would see it firsthand. This person head of software, how does he behave? This, uh, this person head of hardware, how does she behave? What are the things they're doing? What's the politics? And after I graduated from Waterloo, uh, the, su the, the summary of it was that, well, I want to open my own company <laughs> because I felt in a bigger company, I, I cannot operate. But then later on, as I learned more, I said, actually, there is an advantage in a bigger company because it gives you exposure to international, to scale, to all the other things. So then I went and joined Nortel. Then I spun back out into private company again and so forth. So I think it's, um, it's very important uh, to get that experience, um, you know, and working with, pe with, with other companies and uh, based on the people that are working there, I think it's very, very important to look at their, um, the caliber of the people that you're joining and what they've done and um, which would give you the maximum opportunity to learn 
you don't have to be there for like 20 years or what have you, but at least it gives you a good taste of what it could be. Um, uh, so that's, that's one option. Or you can jump with both feet in. I, I, I'm not against either. I'm just saying what, what has worked for, um, you know, for me. Um, and then um, uh, I guess constantly, if you join the startup, try to expand your responsibilities. If you if you brought to the startup because of the tape because of the expertise you have, see if you can not only show excellence in that area, but then see okay, well I want to if I'm in silicon photonics, I want to also know what the laser is doing. I also want to know the packaging. I also want to know how the driver TIA works. I also want to know system. Constantly strive to ask for more and more and more um, because that would that would broaden your horizon. Also, it will it, you'll interact with different people. And I think that's invaluable. It's not like a university. Um, I was telling the guys, um, our uh, one of our chips is coming back, and I was thinking, well, we have the best university right now <laughs> in Ranovis because what comes back, we have to test it, we have to then analyze it, remodel it, then do the next tape out. So these look for companies that are in these type of phases, and uh, if you're there for a year, you will see the entire cycle, which is really, really important, I think, in terms of. The investment and you're basically learning on someone else's dime which is also uh, and they, they know that as well so they they would have to do their best to keep you you know and that's their job so uh, so don't be don't be shy of that um, and last one is uh, expand your network you know that's uh, that has been the main theme throughout um, everything uh, that uh, um, you know I, I travel a lot before COVID and every time everywhere I went I called up my friends that I knew were in that area and we'll go for supper. I, I have a soccer team I play with in California. So you, you sort of constantly are, and, and you don't know what comes out of it. You know, two years, five years, 10 years down the road, one of them is gonna to come to you and say, well, we're trying to sell this company. Would you wanna run it or something like that? So, and not that you do it for those purposes, but your network is your net worth in a way in this, uh, in this ecosystem. So, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you'll, um, you know, you'll come across some great people as you go through these type of experiences. And, and uh, at one point in time, the, the right thing will come across you and you'll evaluate it, you make the right decision about it and you get started.